Hey, welcome back. I am grateful that you are joining us for our midweek Bible study uh, at College Side. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Wherever you're at, whenever you're watching, I'm grateful that you're making the choice uh, to study with us a little bit more. Um, we started several weeks ago a, quest, uh, a series called We've All Got Questions um, because my conviction is we all have questions and it's okay to have questions. Questions are not a bad thing. Um, in fact, if somebody doesn't have questions, that ought to, to raise a red flag be, because we've all got them. Um, I, I want to say again, I'm so grateful for the, the, the folks that have sent me emails to ask questions and to send in comments. Um, thank you for taking the time and, and having the heart to do that. We started last week talking about Romans chapter 1 and, and, and starting to think about how, how do we interact with people um, who are kind of walking a different path. Culture has changed and the world has changed significantly even. And I don't just mean in the last couple of months, although the world has changed some in the last couple of months. I really mean in comparison to 20 years ago, certainly 30 or 40 years ago, the world thinks about the church differently uh, than it did then. So how do we interact with people uh, who have some serious questions about God, who, who are even wondering, does God exist or not? Is, is all of this real or not? And so I, I want to at least spend one more week in, in that, uh, on that path. So that's what we're going to do tonight. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and flip over to Acts chapter 17. I think it's a, a great landing spot for us as we think about um, this idea. And before we read and before we talk a little bit, let's have a word of prayer and ask God to bless our time, and then we'll jump in. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the power of your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to, to sit in the word. God, I pray that as we do that right now, that you would bless us. That as we see and hear from the Apostle Paul, that we would learn what you want us to learn, but also that we would learn how we can interact and defend and help edify and instruct built on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would bless our time and I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's no greater warning throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, that's given um, in the whole Bible other than to stay away and avoid idolatry. Now when I say that word idolatry, I don't know what comes to your mind. Um, I think generally speaking, and you may be an exception to this, but generally speaking, when I use the word idolatry, you probably initially think about a figure like a statue of something that people in the Old Testament, people in the ancient world built or created or crafted or purchased and in an effort to bow down to this idol and worship this idol as a God. Perhaps you think about some of the major world religions in the ancient world, Greek mythology or Roman mythology or paganism uh, that took root all across the world and, but took on different forms and shapes and varieties in, in terms of the gods they worshipped. 
probably when I use the word idolatry, if you go down a layer or two, you think that idolatry is something ancient. It's something that belongs to history, something that existed thousands of years ago that doesn't exist today. But what's interesting to me is that if we assume that and if we think that idolatry is something ancient, is something historical, why does the Bible spend so much time, so much space, devote so much square footage to the idea and topic and defense against idolatry? There's no more uh, warning that's given more than that to avoid idolatry. Idolatry is not something that is isolated to history. You, you got to know that. I want you to understand that right now. Idolatry is not something that just exists in history. Ed Stetzer, uh, who is a really well-known evangelical scholar, college professor, and church planter, uh, wrote an article uh, in the past in Christianity Today. And this is what Stetzer says. Is it that a 12-inch tall piece of wood or bronze can do something bad to us? Or is it that we do something awful to ourselves when we place adoration and attention that should go to God in other things. When it comes to idolatry, Stetzer says, the danger is not in an item. The danger is in us. It was John Calvin who said, our heart is an idol factory. In a fallen world, people constantly seek things they can worship even though the Creator is before us in plain view, we are all looking for something to worship and serve. Idols come easy, but go hard. Now, that's worth saying again. Idols come easy, but go hard. That's what Stetzer says. And I think he's right. We talked last week from Romans chapter 1 about God being in plain view. And if we are going to approach people who, for whatever reason, don't see that God is in plain view, we've got to be captivated by God. In creation itself, like we look up at the sky and realize that there is something, someone bigger that is out there. And we ought to reflect on that reality and ultimately, we ought to feel conviction to share that reality with those who don't hold the view and the faith and the belief and the truth that we share right now. Paul, on all of his missionary journeys, we're going to look at one experience tonight on one missionary journey in particular, but, but all of his missionary journeys, Paul experienced people who were idolatrous. And it wasn't that these folks were like evil in their hearts. They, they just didn't share the view that Paul knew to be true. And so we find an interesting, I think, like I said before, excellent landing spot in Acts chapter 17, where Paul arrives in Athens, which is today and even was then the capital city of uh, all of the Greek area in the world and all of the Greek islands. It was one of the most important cities 
in the ancient world. It was a cultural melting pot. Athens was the place of Plato and Aristotle. And Paul went to the Areopagus, which is really close to the Parthenon. Um, You're probably familiar with that. And, And one of the things that I had the opportunity to do back several years ago was actually visit this place. You have the Parthenon, you have the Areopagus, which is in and around a place that we call Mars Hill. And all of that place is elevated up over the city. And so the image that we ought to see in our minds when we think about the backdrop of Acts chapter 17 is Paul walking up this mountain, literally standing within feet of the Parthenon, which was one of the most important temples dedicated to uh, the Greek gods, lowercase g, Paul could see it. He was standing in the shadow of the Parthenon, but he was having a conversation with some of the world's leading intelligent people, philosophers, all across the world. This was the place of Plato. This was the place of Aristotle. And even though they weren't around in the time of Paul, their students were. Those that walked their path were. Those that still debated and had discourse and dialogue about all of their philosophies were still there in and around Mars Hill, in and around the city of Athens. And here comes Paul, a Christian preacher, convicted by the Holy Spirit with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, interacting with some of the smartest people on the planet who who argued and conversed and had dialogue every day about things, the way of the world, why things are the way they are. What should we believe and what should our response to that belief be? In terms of religion, but also in terms of relationships. Now, I I know that all of us, I I think it's fair to say that all of us share uh, a common desire. And that is to understand more and better how to relate with people today. People who are skeptical about faith. People who claim to be agnostic. Maybe maybe they're spiritual, maybe they're not, but they're agnostic. And, And even people who claim atheism. How do we interact? Because all three categories, people who say they're skeptical, people who say they're agnostic, people who say they're atheist, all three categories are on the rise in the world today. There are more self-proclaimed, self-avowed atheists that exist today than have ever existed in the history of the world. There are more people claiming skepticism than have ever existed in the world. Like as a religion almost, I'm a skeptic or I'm an agnostic. I think Acts 17 gives us a really good view into how we can interact with people regardless of where they are. So let's read the passage a little bit together. I'm going to make a couple of comments, and then at the end of going through the passage, I've got a couple of practical suggestions. Pick it up with me in Acts chapter 17 and start in the 16th verse. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. There's that word, idol. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? 
Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, let, let me hit pause there, okay? And, and just think about some of the words that the text has used just in Acts 17, 16, 17, and 18. There's a couple of words that I want you to draw your attention to. I want you to zero in on and focus on. In the 16th verse, the text says that Paul's spirit was provoked. Now underline the word provoked. I don't know what translation you're reading from. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That's the word that is used in, uh, in the ESV. Ultimately, Paul saw something and he responded. He responded. He knew what he believed to be true. He knew the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He experienced that himself. He saw the way of the world and he knew this is not right. And he felt conviction. Conviction. Conviction to say something conviction to do something, he felt conviction. He, he felt responsible to share the message of Jesus. Now, I, I, let me just say, this is very different from seeing the way of the world and retreating. Which, if we're being honest, is something that a lot of people feel today. I see the way of the world. I see what's happening in the world. I hear all these questions. I, I watch the news. I read the paper. I, I see everything. I don't like what I see, so let me just retreat. Let me go into the place where I find safety. That's not Paul. Paul didn't retreat. Paul felt conviction. Paul felt provoked. Paul felt responsibility to engage culture, and so should we. Now, in the 17th verse, uh, it says, so he reasoned. So he felt provoked. He felt responsibility. So in an effort to respond to the responsibility that he felt, in an effort to respond to the conviction that he felt, he goes and engages with culture and he reasoned. Mm. <laughs> Which is a really interesting phrase. You know, real practically, Paul conversed. He reasoned. And this is something that I think, culturally speaking, for us today, we've lost a little bit of. Having conversations. Now, in Paul's day and at this time in the ancient world, there was regular debate. There was regular uh, dialogue. Um, there was regular arguing in logic. It's how they operated, it's how they lived, it's how they conversed. But what's important, what I want you to know, is that they conversed. Even if their voices were elevated as they argued this philosophy or that philosophy, they conversed. They listened. One of my favorite Aristotle quotes, and Aristotle was one of the leading philosophers uh, that still had students walking in his wake at the time of Paul, said, it is the mind of an educated man to be able to listen to a thought, to be able to entertain a thought, even if he does not accept it as true. What's Aristotle saying? Philosophically, I ought to be able to hear somebody out whether or not I believe what they're saying is true. It's the mind of an educated man. 
to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it as true. And Aristotle's got followers. and They talked. They, they, they climbed the hill every day on Mars Hill and just talked and reasoned and conversed. They listened. That's important. They listened. Now in the 18th verse, there's a a couple of phrases that the text uses that's really important because it gives us a window into what Paul's message was. Based on what Paul was saying, if you skip to the middle of the verse, some said as a response to Paul's message, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So if he's preaching the resurrection, he's got to be preaching the cross, he's got to be preaching the death, he's got to be preaching the burial uh, to get to the resurrection. His message is vitally important. He was talking about Jesus. He was preaching Jesus. He wasn't preaching all this stuff on the side. He was preaching Jesus on Mars Hill. Now read uh, read the 19th verse with me. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. They're conversing with Paul. Verse 20, For you bring some strange things to our ears. They wanted to know more. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21, Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something no. Verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, now, Paul is standing in the middle of all these people. You kind of get the image that Paul is in the middle of the circle, and you've got these, this world's leading philosophers sitting all around him, intently listening to the message that Paul is preaching, which, as we said before, is the message of Jesus Christ. Some of the smartest men in the world. And Paul's got them. They want to know this message. And the rest of this section of text, starting in the 22nd verse, going all the way down to the 31st verse, is essentially the message that Paul proclaims. I want to read every single verse so that we save a little bit of time. This is what Paul says. Pick it up with me in verse 22. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. I know this. If we are going to converse with people who do not believe what we believe, we must start with you are rather than you're not. That cannot be overstated. As we live in a world of skepticism and agnosticism and atheism, telling people what they're not first is not going to work. But telling people what they are is a window to be able to deliver the message. Paul knows what he's doing. Paul's trained in logic. Paul's trained in debate. Paul feeling the responsibility and the conviction from the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel message of Jesus Christ knows you start with you are. When we tell people what they're not, we never have a window. We never have a window. Start with you are. Verse 23, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Paul has spent time paying attention to the experiences of other people, even though he does not believe in them. Paul believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. He believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, trained up in the ways of 
of the Jewish faith. He believes in God. But in Athens, he has spent time learning, trying to understand, seeking to listen, so that he can take the truth of God and the truth of Jesus Christ and plan it in a context. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And he starts to tell the story. He has learned enough about these folks to be able to jump off of what they believe and to tell the truth of Jesus Christ. Now skip down with me to the 29th verse. The other, the other uh, verses are worth reading and they deal specifically with idolatry, but, but, but skip to the 29th verse. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. It's not something that you can create, this divine image. Even though you are creative, even though you have imagination, and even though this place is filled with the most beautiful objects of worship, God cannot be contained. And what you know to be unknown, I know. The times of ignorance, verse 30, God overlooked but now he commands all people to repent. Which is what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, right? Repentance. Repentance. Here's what I want you to see on a really basic level before I give some practical suggestions and just maybe analyze a little bit of, of what's going on in this passage. Paul starts with you are. Always the best place to start with anybody, believer or otherwise. He preaches the message. He contextualizes the message in a way they understand. You have this out there. All of you men of the Areopagus, to the unknown God, I'm telling you, what you say is unknown, I know. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he commands you to repent. Paul starts with you are, contextualizes in ways they understand. He speaks their language, but he also follows through with obedience. And I don't know about you, but, but I know for me, all three of those pieces are vitally important. You are, contextualization, but don't forget the message. Don't forget the message of obedience. God has overlooked times of ignorance in the past, but He commands everyone everywhere to repent. He asks of you. He commands you, follow Jesus. Come to the line of sin. Realize it's sin. Repent of that in your heart by asking for forgiveness, turning away and walking in the other direction. The path that is laid out by Jesus Christ. All three of those pieces are vitally important. Let me say them again. You are contextualizing the message, but preaching the message of obedience. Look what happens. Now, when they heard of the, this is verse uh, 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They didn't believe it. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. I, I underline the word some. There were results but they weren't widespread. I think that's really important for the church to understand as we deal with philosophies. 
the philosophies of academics and intelligence and as we deal with the philosophies of atheism or agnosticism or skepticism. We cannot only do something or say something when we think it will change everything. Be faithful to the opportunity you have right in front of you and some people respond. It's an interesting um, passage. L- let me give you three points here in terms of application that I think are always true universally throughout history, but also now as we deal with the idolatry of the 21st century, as we deal with people giving affection to the creation rather than the creator, as we deal with people who are after the creation rather than the creator. Three things that are universally true. And here's the first one, converse. What I mean by that is listen. Listen. Don't just listen in order to respond. Listen to listen. Listen to understand. Listen. Listen. I got new glasses last week. And it had been longer than it, had, than it should have been to get new glasses. I don't have great eyesight, um, but I got new glasses last week, and I'm thankful uh, for, for them because I can certainly see better. If, if I took my glasses off and if I gave them to you and you put my glasses on, unless you had the exact same prescription I had, you would not be able to see. You wouldn't be able to see. It would all look foggy. It would all look fuzzy. It would all look weird. It would give you a headache at some point. Now, if I took my glasses off, Stephen Covey has done this exercise um, several times um, in major conferences. Uh, Stephen Covey's the guy who wrote the book, uh, Habits of Highly Effective Leaders. If you put my glasses on, And if I looked at you and said, try harder to see, would you be able to see? Like if you were wearing my glasses, could you try hard enough to see? Well, of course you couldn't. (laughs) It's not about trying. It's not about a matter of the heart. It's not about desire. You see the way you see. So if we're going to lead people to the truth, we must first understand how they see so that when we show the truth and reveal the truth, they can see it. We say all the time, yeah, the world has changed. Listen, The gospel message of Jesus Christ does not change. The fundamental tenets of Christianity have not changed. But how we communicate must change. That's what Paul did. And not just in Athens, but everywhere he went. He took the unchanging, absolute authoritative message of Jesus Christ and planted it in contexts that were different. And in every city he went into, he changed that slightly. Not the message, but the method. We've got to do the same. And so if the world is increasing in skepticism, we ought to understand why are they seeing that the way they're seeing that? What lens are they looking through? How can we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ present things in such a way that makes sense? And where it starts is listening. It's not in formulating answers and in proof texting why this is the way that it is. It is genuinely and earnestly listening to people. 
and not feeling threatened. It's listening not to respond, but to understand and conversing with people, having conversation. Have you noticed in the world today it's awfully easy if, if you've got people who disagree about things, they're talking on top of this person and this person in kind talks on top of this person and everybody's just talking over each other. And we think if we get louder that somehow that makes us more right. That's not the way that Paul did it. And it's not the way that we should either. We listen to understand. It's the mark of an educated man, of an educated mind to entertain a thought without believing it to be true. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. you got to contextualize the message of Jesus Christ in a way that people understand. This assumes a couple of things. This assumes an understanding culturally. It assumes that you understand whoever it is that you're interacting with, that you are earnestly trying to understand their perspective. It also assumes that you know the Word. Let me, let me give you an encouragement. If you've got somebody in mind who's seeing through a different set of glasses, I want you to stop when you're done with this, and I want you to pray to the Lord God, give me wisdom in figuring out how to take the unchanging message and give it to this person in a way that is kind and in a way that they understand. And the more you pray that prayer, the more understanding I believe you will have. I read a lot of times from the New International Version application commentary set. The author of the commentary on Acts, Ajith Fernando, said this, We must always preach the God of the ages, plural, over the God of the age. So maybe a little bit of wisdom in this area of contextualizing is revealing to people how what they are doing and what they are believing in actually is much newer than what we know to be the Christian faith. Every generation has a God of the age. You think back just over the last several decades in our context, and probably it wouldn't take you very long to think within a specific decade, that was the God of the age. That was the God of the age. That was the God of the age. We serve the God of the ages. And that slight nuance, I think, gives a window into helping people understand, at least see initially, that the God we serve is much older <laughs> than anything they believe is a God today. The second thing is contextualized. Here's the third thing. Preach obedience. If you look at any God of the age throughout history, very little is wrapped up in obedience. People can come and go as they please. People can do as they please. There, there's no obedience that is outside of a person. It's not just something that's beneficial. Faith, real faith, rooted in truth and reality and data and history and relation, true faith, true faith, always, always, always requires something of us. And so if faith doesn't require something of us, it's not really faith. It's flesh. Paul preached the message, repent. Repent. Listen, we live in a hard time. And every generation in the church has been able to make the same statement. We live in a hard time. But I want you to know that by conversing, that by contextualizing, and that by preaching repentance, we are actually helping people see through the lens of Jesus Christ in a way that they understand. 
converse, be willing to listen, contextualize, plant that message in a way that they understand. And that can even be a situational thing. Preach repentance and obedience. That's what Paul did in one of the most challenging environments in the world. And some believe. People have choice, but some believed. Let's have a word of prayer together. God, we pray that that results would come. We pray that some would come to know you based on the message of Jesus. We pray that we would know it more, that we would know it better, that culturally we would know people more and we would know people better so that we can connect the two. Father, help us listen. Listen to understand, not just to respond. And help us ultimately root our message in what you ask of us in response to your great love and grace. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed.